I was born a black man in America. I was born a black gay man in this world. Um, that's a big fat no for a lot of people in a lot of spaces most of the time. Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. I'm Christian Guru Murphy, and this is the podcast in which we talk to extraordinary people about the big ideas in their lives and the events that have helped shape them. My guest this week is the award-winning actor and singer, Billy Porter, who has a new album out called Black Mona Lisa. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So, so let's start with the album. Yes, why, please. Why, why Black Mona Lisa? So we were sitting around and Black Mona Lisa came sort of fell out of the sky. I don't even remember where it came from. But it was like 30 seconds of silence. And then like 20 minutes later, the song wrote itself. And what was really interesting about it is that it was after the song was written that the meaning of it sort of landed for me. And that is that the actual Mona Lisa is classic relevant, past, present, future, always. Um, that's what I want my legacy to be. So that's where it's from, that's what it's about. And the artwork is, you know, about me busting out of the frame. You know, if you see it, it's like, I'm, I can't be confined by the frame, by the picture frame, by the artwork frame, I gotta, I gotta bust out of it. What is the frame in your life? Because, you, you know, you've often talked in those terms about busting out mm -hmm. of the confines of convention, of society, of mm -hmm. sexual norms, of, of, of identifying as queer, all, all of those things. So what, what is the frame that, into which you were born? I was born a black man in America. I was born a black gay man in this world. Um, that's a big fat no for a lot of people in a lot of spaces most of the time. And I'm 54 years old. Uh, you know, I always say I'm grateful to have lived long enough to see this day, a day where expansion has happened. You know, I always speak of the change, how the change has already actually happened, which is why the pushback is so severe. You know, historically, this happens all the time. When progress is made in a major way, there's going to be pushback. That's just how it goes. That's the circle of life. Um, I feel very lucky and blessed to be in this time, you know, where I can and must stand in the fullness of my authenticity um, and make sure that that's what I'm leading with no matter what. Do you think we're in the, in the progress or the pushback right now? We're in both. They always, yes, they always go together. Yes, and always. They always have to go together. I mean, you know, sometimes it's heavier than others. I do feel like we were in a progressive period for a good 50, 60 years from the civil rights movement. And, you know, with the repeal of, of Roe v. Wade, I think we've all been snatched back with Trump. We've all been snatched back into reality. When Roe v. Wade goes away, then they're coming for me next. Who knows how? Who knows when? Who knows how? It's a slippery slope when the government starts dictating how people live their lives and make the choices in their own lives, with their own bodies, with their own children. You know, we're in this space. And so we must address it head on and fight it head on. That's just what it is. So, so can, you, can you take me back to sort of childhood then about when you say you were born a, you were born a black gay child in America. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, take, take me back to sort of early childhood and what that felt like then. I grew up in the Pentecostal church. I was a very effeminate child, a sissy, if you will. And uh, that made a lot of people nervous in my family, in my community. By the time I was five, they already sent me to, they, had, they sent me to a, a psychologist every Wednesday after school to get checked out. And after a year, 
Um, this psychologist told my mother in front of me that I was fine. Um, and she just needed to get a man around the house to teach me how to be more of a man because I was living with my mother and my grandmother and my great aunt and my other aunts. And, you know, at that time, this is early 70s, you know, we didn't have language for stuff that we have today. We didn't have the language. So that was my first memory. Did you remember what that felt like? Yeah, it's my first memory of feeling like something's wrong with you for no other reason than you're, you've been born a certain way. Did you try to behave differently? Did you try yes. to behave less? I did. I mean, sissy, as you call it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I tried to do all of the things that I was supposed to do so that I could just exist and not be bullied every time I walked into school and not be dismissed every time I walked into my house and not be marginalized because I didn't play sport. You know, like it was just so many um, things to navigate, so many traumas in that space. So when did you discover performance? I started singing in church when I was five. And I always knew then because that was a moment in the church space where I was accepted and I was received and I was honored and seen. Um, you know, when I participated in the talent show for the first time in fifth grade, around 10, I sang and the bullying stopped. You know, I won the talent show and the bullying stopped. We were still at a time and a place in our culture at that time, at least when if you had a skill or a talent or something, people would leave you alone because you represented something good for the, for the whole. So do you think you saw this as that at the time, that performance was a route out of the bullying? Yeah. Rather than just of course. the high of, of, of performance yeah. itself? No, it was, it was a direct correlation. I sang. I won the talent show. The bullies were impressed. They stopped beating me up. That's it. You know, it, it was that clear and that plain. Um, yeah. Is that still the case today? I do think that excellence will always be the answer to any kind of bullying on any level, any kind of rejection, any kind of dismissal, any, any of it. Excellence transcends all of that. How much is performance for you an end in itself? you know, the, the joy of singing or the joy of acting, and how much is it a route to something? It's yes and. It's not one or the other. It's a yes and situation. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the only way I can really describe it. Because you talk about your legacy, you know, the legacy you want with, right. you know, with, this, with this record yeah. and with everything else that you're doing. Yeah. So, I mean... Did you have a sense of what you want that legacy to be? Do I? Yeah. Yeah. What do you I want people to say about it. you? I, I just want people to know that I cared about humanity. You know, I, 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 I want people to know that I use my art to heal. How can this work possibly heal somebody else's trauma. Like art has healed mine and continues to heal mine. It's my connection to my art. That's the only reason why I'm still alive and the only reason why I'm sane doing it. As a, so as a, as a young, as a, as a child effectively, um, or an adolescent, um, what was the sort of the primary thing you were trying to heal? The rejection from your own is very difficult 
And from my own, I mean from my family, from my church community, conditional love. It was conditional. When I was singing, it was great. Every other time I was an abomination. Before I could even comprehend what being queer meant physically or sexually. Um, I was abused, sexually abused at the hands of my stepfather from the time I was seven to the time I was 12. Um, I came out at 16 years old in 1985 and went directly to the front lines during the AIDS crisis. So I don't, you know, it was all trauma. My entire childhood was just a one big ball of trauma. And the only thing that saved me was my art. I had some place to go and put all of that energy, harness it in a way that was not only healing, but also fulfilling creatively, spiritually. And I've been able to make a living doing it at the same time. So when your art is on hold because of something like the strike, that must be torture. Yeah, it's horrible. It's been really horrible. People who aren't in show business only see the glitz and the glamour of it. We are blue collar freelance workers, period. Even the superstars who got lucky and make the F you money. And when you can lock into some sort of consistency, financial consistency, that's a gift. It's a real gift. And just as consistent as it can be, one day the rug can get pulled right out from under that. And I've been speaking about the, the strike in particular in tears. We're in tears. You know, you have tier one, which is hand to mouth. You have tier two, which is check to check. You have tier three, which is doing all right. You have tier four, which is set for life. And you have tier five, which is F you money. I had reached tier three, which is I'm doing all right on the way to set for life. What we were fighting for in these negotiations were those set for life contracts. Back in the day and up until recently, a hundred episodes was the golden was the golden number. You get a hundred episodes, you go into syndication. Syndication is where you make your money for the rest of your life. Every time they play that show on television, those people are getting money. Enough money to live on. You think of that structure as well. The network structure is 18 to 26 episodes per season. So you're already getting that, you're getting your quote 18 to 26 times in a year. That's a robust amount of money. So now, you go to streaming, you're anywhere from six to 13 episodes if you're lucky. So now, it's already been cut in half. Your scale, your, your wage has already been cut in half simply because of the new structure. I'm making six cent checks on Pose, a show that I won an Emmy for. So what do you mean you're making? Six cent residual checks. What? That's what you're getting. Yes. That's what we're getting. Some of us are getting six cent checks. No. No. That's why we, we were on strike for 118 days. No. Y'all don't get to do that to us anymore. And so have you really lost a home? Yes. Is it, is, it, is, it, is it your home? Why would it's I be lying? Home? Yeah. Of I'm, course. I'm not suggesting that. I'm just sort of, you know. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I, you're just I being a. You're I, I just, just read being that a journalist. And I kind of thought, really? I mean, yes, you know, yeah. It is. I'm one. I, 
everybody in this business, except for the ones who are making the FU money, are three months away from homelessness. If you got laid off tomorrow and didn't get a job for three months, you'd be in a... That's what it is. It's not fair. It's not right. But 118 days is a long time. Yeah. I was supposed to be doing a lot of different things. It'll happen again. It'll be back again. You know, and... I mean, I happen to be getting a divorce at the same time. So there's the divorce and, the, you know, so it's like... There's complications. It's, there. a, yeah. it's a whole other, you know, and... So how important is an album like this to you financially as well as creating? Well, the, you don't make no music. You don't make no money in music. At this level that I'm at, I don't make any money So right this is now. just creative. This, this is, is creative. And, but like, that's the thing about being successful as a creative person. Being successful as a creative artist does not always necessarily mean you're wealthy and make money doing it. Sometimes you don't. You know, I'm not an artist because I wanna be wealthy. I'm an artist because I'm an artist. I've been called to be an artist. So, you know, there's a calling on my life. There's a purpose. This is my ministry. I speak in those spiritual terms because I do come from the church. But this is my ministry. This is what I was called on this earth to do. So I find um, peace. Even in the midst of all of this, I find peace. This music is about peace. It's about celebration of life. It's about love. It's about joy. It's about hope. You know, it's the inner, it's, and... It is, this is my fifth album. My first album came out, R&B album, mainstream, in the marketplace in 1997. The industry was very homophobic at the time, and there was no place for me. You know, now 27 years later, I get another shot and I get to do it on my own terms. This is a magical time for me. I wrote all but one song on the record. Every word is from the depths of my soul. Every beat, every chord, every melody, every, it has been crafted finally to represent the full me. Not just a compartment, but the fullness of everything and all the things that I am. So, so how important is it to you then, having done that, that, that you get an audience and that the audience love it? The most important. That's the, that, yeah. Without that, it's not a success. Well, I, no, I don't, that's, I don't say that. Without it, it's not a commercial or financial success. Do I want it to be commercially successful? Absolutely. Is it already successful? Absolutely. My stuff has been successful for me. You know, just getting to, you know, from the page to the stage, as we call it, that's success. So when you say in 1997, there was a lot of homophobia in the industry. Mm -hmm. I mean, has it gone? No, no. but so it's, it's better. So how, how does it affect you now? It's better. I am out and gay and queer, and I have an album out on Republic Records and Island in the UK, and they support me as a black, queer, out, loud, and proud artist. That did not exist before. You could not do that before. You couldn't do that in 1997. You just couldn't. And why do you think that's changed? I don't know why. I don't ask that it question. Just it just has. You know, the world changes. We expand, hopefully. You know, we grow, hopefully. The hope is that we grow and we evolve and things get better. That's the hope. You know, I, I, it's been such an interesting journey over these last few years for me. And Learning how to love myself unconditionally, myself unconditionally, and show up for myself first. It's easy to wallow in the pain. It's easy to choose that. That's human nature. 
it's harder to go, I choose joy. I choose it. It's a choice and it's not an easy one. And every day I recommit myself to choosing it. Sometimes I'm very successful. Sometimes I'm not successful at all. But it's in the trying that allows for some sort of consistency. I'm looking for consistency. How can I consistently show up and show out for myself? And, and what, what, I mean, what is it that happened in the last few years that made you do that or that enabled you to do that? COVID was really interesting for me. And I don't talk about it a lot because I don't want to sound disrespectful to the pain and the trauma that in, it has inflicted on our society. I've never been able to stop and be still ever in my life. I've never been able to do that. And it is inside of the forced halt that all of a sudden I had time to peel back some layers in, in, in work that I needed to do on myself. I went into trauma therapy, specific trauma therapy, to heal old stuff that I just never got a chance to like really, do. you know, I had gotten to a place where I had healed as much as I could and I needed to go deeper in a different way. And this time, that two years, almost three, I was able to like drop in to a kind of process, excavation, healing, um, self-healing that I had just literally never had the time to do before. That, that's amazing, isn't it? I mean, the yeah. COVID kind of saved your life in a way. For another time, you know, it's like my life has been saved so many times at this point. Yes, in this moment, it was like COVID shifted everything for me, grounded me more, cracked me open, returned me to a spirituality that I had abandoned for some years because I had been so hurt by the religious community. And you know, religion is man-made. I believe that spirituality is divine. So I've been navigating my way back to how I ground myself spiritually again. If you could go back to that Pentecostal church that you were part of as a child, mm -hmm. you know, and give the sermon, what would be the message? God is love and love is God, period. And stop weaponizing religion to justify y'all's hate because you're uncomfortable, because something or somebody makes you uncomfortable, so you try to get a Bible verse to erase them. It's crazy. It's insane. Can I ask you a little bit about sort of how you see, I mean, you've talked about, you know, your struggle, your sacrifice, um, the pain you've had to endure, if you like, in order to, um, deliver your vision of gender neutrality, that creative sort of sense, the look that we see on the Met Ball carpet. Mm -hmm. um, what, would, what do you mean by, you know, that's, what, what, is, what has been that, the essence of that struggle to sort of deliver that? Society in general are extremely fearful of things they don't know or understand. And that's in all cultures, all identities, any, everybody. We all have a version of fearing 
what we don't know or haven't known or don't understand. We all have a version and an aversion to embracing what we don't know or understand. It's inside of that embrace to me that the healing is. That's the place where it is. When we are uncomfortable and we embrace and lead with love inside of that uncomfortable space anyway, there's a healing in that. And uh, we got to get back to that. We have to get back to collectively doing that. I don't know what that means. I don't know what it looks like. I know that this album, you know, music is the universal language. This album, every song speaks to that, speaks to that presence, speaks to that need to lead with love and hope and peace and honesty and vulnerability. And that's how I engage. And do you think there's a lack of honesty in the way a lot of um, people, public figures, engage with that topic, with equality? Yeah. There's a lot of BS. There's a lot of lip service. There's a lot of performative allyship. Um, what, what, what is that? Just explain what you think performative allyship is. Performative allyship is when a company, for instance, a big brand will support LGBTQ plus month. And then you find out that they've contributed to some conservatives, you know, run for office a conservative that votes against LGBTQ and trans rights. It's like, that's performative. That's an easy way of showing it. It's like, so on the one hand, you're gonna say yes, and on the other hand, behind the scenes, you're doing something completely different. So you just want the attention and you wanna look woke to the general public. But what you're really doing is what you really want to do. I mean, that, that's obviously on. You can you can see that in corporates. That's America, the extreme. That's the extreme. Do you, do you see it in artists as well? Yeah, I mean, I would rather talk about the positive version of it. Okay. You know, like a Ryan Murphy, for instance, who understood with Pose that if this story about the black and brown drag and trans and queer communities of the 80s during the AIDS crisis was ever going to get told, the ball culture was ever going to get told, he was going to have to use his white, cisgendered, queer muscle to make it and to make sure that it got made right. He went into FX and he said, you're going to give me three years of this. It won't work unless we have three seasons. You're going to give me the promotional budget that you gave me for the O.J. Simpson story. You're going to make this happen. This is not going to happen unless we invest. It's not something that you can just do and then throw against the wall and hope that it sticks. It can't be that. If we're going to do this allyship thing, we have to follow it all the way through. And he taught us all how to fish. He was really there and present. That's real allyship. For the follow through, the whole thing. The whole thing. Certainly in this country, and I don't know what it's like in America, but the, the queer community, if that's a phrase mm -hmm. I should use on, on this, um, has been a bit divided by the trans question. How do, you, how do you feel about that? It doesn't matter how I feel. Um, what do you think is right? It's wrong. wrong? to be a marginalized group of people and then turn around and marginalize another group of people. It doesn't make any sense. And if we continue to eat our own, we will never have equality. That's what the other side hopes and wishes, is that we devour ourselves. I am honestly trying to 
be a beacon of change in that regard. You know, just in terms of like, if I get somewhere, if I get a certain kind of success, I want to be able to fly those doors open for the folks coming behind me to get the same kind of success. You know, we must do that for each other. Like Kamala Harris says, she, I, I, she said, I might be the first, but I'm definitely not going to be the last. It's like, I don't want to be the only black queer person in, you know, vibrating in this space. I mean, only because you bring her up, Kamala Harris might well be the first and the last, then, mightn't she? Because people are no, horrible about not. her. It's all right. They're horrible about everybody. It's okay. But she gets it particularly, doesn't she? Is that she, because she's a, yeah, she's a black woman? Of course. You know, they say she's not well, good she's enough. She's a woman and she's black. So, you know, it's, there are, people are always going to talk mess. Joe Biden is 478 years old and everything he said he was going to do, he has done. And the only thing people are talking about is his age. It's like, look at his record. It doesn't matter. His age doesn't matter. He's delivering on what he said he was going to do. This is not a normal cycle. It's not normal. If we don't lean into Biden, it will be Trump and America will be done. Remember children, Rome fell, period. If you could change the world in any way, how would you change it? If I could just be a peace master, I would just make all the hate go away. Just peace, just peace. How do we get there? I mean, do you say that partly because of what's going on in Israel right now? Or? Everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> it's not just Israel, Ukraine, the United States of America. People are getting shot in the back every day. My people are getting shot, point blank. It's everywhere. It's not just one place. It is everywhere. It's really, really tense right now. And I would just love a little peace. Really. If I could be that person to bring it, I'm, that would make me very happy. Billy Paul, thank you very much. Thank you.